close. Okay, and he's actually gonna talk to us about a really interesting project about, uh, this is one of the first work I've seen that's been doing static analysis of pseudo random number generators. And so, uh, once I get the thumbs up in the back, are we good? All right, cool, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, this is joint work with Felix Dörre. And the motivating question behind our research was, how do we actually know that our PRNGs are working? And of course, this also means how do we know they're working properly? Um, this is an interesting question because if the PRNG fails, then many things will actually go to hell. As um, this list shows, this is a list of services that were affected um, as Debian mispatched OpenSSL PRNG, a well-known Debian disaster from 2006 to 2008. And if anything spells single point of failure, then probably this list. Um, so we, we really need to make sure that the um, pseudo random numbers that our cryptography systems are consuming are in some sense good. And um, so the preliminary answer to the question, how do we know when we started doing this research was surprisingly, we do not really know. There are very few, there are almost non-technical quality assurance measures for PRNGs. So of course the theoreticians know uh, which constructions are good, but then theoreticians avoid implementing things and for good reasons. And implementers do their own thing and, uh, well, how can we actually assure that the implementations are correct? Uh, here is a brief list of things that people might or might not be doing. So the overwhelming measure for assurance is manual code review currently. This is basically the only thing that people are doing. So they're looking at the code and they say, oh, okay, it, it will be fine. It, it will work. Um, a number of other things that one could think one could be doing are not done for reasons. So for example, yeah, no. in, in typical other software, one could do system level tests or functional verification. And here, this is really hard to do because the definition of correctness of a PRNG is that this is a piece of software that takes a little amount of entropy, random data, and then expands into to a stream that is indistinguishable from real randomness to a computationally bounded attacker. And this is, of course, uh, hard to test and also hard to functionally specify and verify. So this is typically not done. Um, what could be helpful is actually unit testing or functional verifications on the unit level, but the majority of PRNGs, and I have looked at a few of them, actually do not have meaningful units. So the code is typically monolithic, and uh, either because the implementers do not bother or because they think, well, it's performance critical, so we inline everything and uh, do that. So this is could help, but is, uh, is not happening. Uh, sometimes one also hears advice, oh, well, there is statistical testing suites uh, for this. And I can tell you that for cryptographic PRNGs, and this is the ones we are here talking about, and this means essentially PRNGs that are on one side used for cryptography, the output is used for cryptography, and on the other side, PRNGs that contain cryptographic um, building blocks in them. And once you have these cryptographic building blocks in them, these statistical test suites are essentially useless. So you can completely forget about that. If, if, if these things fail, then your PRNG has constant output. It's, it's completely broken. And you would notice it certainly by other means. So this is, you can skip this step with good conscience. The only thing, and this is the last and only thing that is kind of halfway working and, and, and to, to a certain degree, is helpful is regression testing, also known as known answer testing. And this essentially means that uh, somewhere you have reference seeds and you have reference output. And of course, you still do not know if um, these reference values somehow, well, capture good behavior. But at least you can be sure that if you change something or you fix something that you think is irrelevant to the overall operation of the PRNG, then you have assurance that you didn't break um, the behavior. And this is in particularly useful if you are implementing actually a standard scheme 
here from the NIST standard because then there is um, the reference seeds and reference outputs in the standard. And at least you can be sure that you're just as good or as bad as the standard. And hopefully people have looked at the standard in more, uh, with more effort. So basically manual code review and then a little bit of uh, regression testing just for those PRNGs. And I've seen just like one or two that implement this standard. So we try to improve on, 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 on the state of matters and uh, what, what we try to do is, is first uh, we realize that there is actually an interesting property that PRNGs are supposed to have and this is not a sufficient property for the PRNG output to be good but it is a necessary property and it is also the one that is common uh, broken in, in the typical incidents that we see. And we call that entropy loss uh, I will explain in a moment what it actually means. And we developed a static analysis to check for entropy loss. Uh, and uh, this static analysis is implemented in a tool that we call Entroposcope. Um, the tool can analyze C and Java implementations and we actually applied it to real uh, PRNGs that you have on your devices, open SSL, uh, and so on and so forth. And we also found um, a few things that should not be there. little of explanation, just how to, how to imagine the inner workings of a PRNG. Um, essentially, you have some kind of internal state, and this is all quite simplified, but conceptually, this is what is necessary to understand the problem. So there is internal state, and there is um, seed. There are seeds, uh, these short uh, pieces of initialization data that are derived somewhere from outside of the system, from the underlying la layer, from the OS, from the hardware, and so on. Um, these are in some way transferred into the PRNG state and then there is a cyclic operation and in every cycle the internal state of the PRNG is perturbed uh, typically by some cryptographic function like a hash function and then in each cycle a little chunk of output is derived from the internal state um, and then the process is repeated again so the state is perturbed another chunk is output and so you obtain a stream. <coughs> And uh, so this expansion process starting from the seed and then doing this uh, mix and, and, and the output is deterministic. This is an important part. So all the non-determinism has been pushed into the selection of the seed. And uh, since the procedure is usually also terminating, we can consider a PRNG as simply a function from a seed, a binary seed of size m bit to some and here we are saying finite uh, prefix of, of the stream, and this is perfectly okay for our purposes, um, of, of length n bit. So essentially it's a function, we call it G for generator, and, and we will be concerned with properties of this total function. Uh, but before I, I go on to talk about entropy loss, I would actually also like to say a few things about things that we do not take care of, because this is also important. Um, and I mean, there are probably countless ways you can break a PRNG, but roughly you can identify different groups, and I will talk about entropy loss later. Uh, but another important way you can break it is just by breaking the seed selection. If you are having seeds that are too small in range, if you're having skewed distribution, if you are seeding your PRNG with current time, a bad idea for several reasons also because Entropy arguments are always only sound with respect to the attacker knowledge. Um, for example, if you have a PRNG in a hardware encrypted hard drive and you seed it with time of production and then print the time of production on the outside case of the drive, um, this is not good for several reasons. True story. So we do not, we do not look at this because this Static analysis cannot help with this. You need a knowledge of the overall system that the PRNG is embedded in. This is a completely different game. Um, the second thing we will not consider is we, we will not actually check that the attacker cannot invert the G function. Um, 
this is typically prevented by using these cryptographic primitives like one-way functions in, in, in the definition of the G function. And sometimes, for example, here it turns out that these one-way one -way function, as we learned yesterday, are not actually one-way, or at least not one-way for everyone. And then, of course, the whole construction breaks down, but this is not something we want to consider. So we assume that the function is actually uninvertible. This is a reasonable assumption. Um, and we are only worried that the attacker is trying to brute force the inner state of the PRNG. And finally, some people also consider attackers that are much more powerful, that, for example, can temporarily inspect the internal state of the PRNG or can actually corrupt the state. I don't know, think electromagnetic pulse or someone with a uh, you know, tempest van outside of your building, things like that. This is also here um, for the moment out of scope. So what we are considering is the thing called entropy loss. And intuitively, that can be defined in any one of these ways. Essentially, it means that you have two seeds that will produce the same output for the given PRNG. Um, mathematically, it means that this G function that I have shown you is not injective. And if you have worked with information flow, this actually means <laughs> that the information flow from seed to the output is reduced. And this is maybe interesting because typically the information flow research concentrates on minimizing information flow for privacy reasons. And this is one um, application where it is crucial to maximize information flow for security. Um, you can also, oh, just a little bit more. So the, the rationale behind having this property is that if you have entropy loss, then it is actually easier to guess the output than to guess the seed, um, which should not be happening. So we should, all the uncertainty that is contained in the seed should also be contained in the output. And mathematically, this can be stated, well, entropy loss can be stated as this simple definition. And you can see maybe that this is a kind of dual to the standard non-interference definition. So non-interference would be the validity with the implications here, and we have satisfiability with, with the conjunction. So these two are in a way duals. Um, right. And we will be indeed reasoning about whether this formula is satisfiable. Uh, and the reasoning is complicated by the use of the above mentioned cryptographic functions in the definition of G. We will get to that. Um, just a few instances of entropy loss that you might have heard about. Uh, the first one that probably started this whole business was that Debian uh, open SSL disaster 2006 to 2008. Um, this is actually a very interesting story. If you have some free time, you can Google for that. It's, it's a perfect storm of technical, human, organizational factors that came together uh, to cause it. It's a it's, it's, um, really suspenseful story. Uh, I would say it was probably not a conscious attempt to install a backdoor. So this, this was more or less an accident. But still, it's, it's very interesting how it could happen and how many things went wrong. Um, just very roughly, the, the problem was that there was a buffer where the entropy was collected. And uh, by mistake or misunderstanding or something, this buffer after Debian patched open a cell was just simply never read. Um, so you could have seeding, but the generator, well, would have output a constant stream, but there was some auxiliary little source of entropy where the PID of the process was incorporated to avoid stream duplication upon forking, and then you essentially just had 15 bit of entropy, and you could only generate 65,000 key pairs on, 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 on the Debian system. Um, the, the, the three vulnerabilities here, they're also ordered in a particular way, and, and this is in a way uh, that goes from kind of simpler to detect or, or requires a simpler test to requires more complicated test. If you have something that is broken in this very stupid way, then you can detect it essentially just with a dynamic analysis. If you know this buffer is supposed to have entropy, you can um, tell GDB to watch if it's ever read or not. And if it's never read, then you already found the bug. Um, but things are not always that simple. Here is one in in, in the Android PRNG, in, in the old Android PRNG. So you can see the top, uh, the top drawing is the PRNG state as the way it was supposed to be. So there is a certain space for the seed and then there is a counter in the padding. 
and then somebody mix up the index, uh, the, didn't update the index properly, and then the counter and the padding actually was written over the seed, and just a little bit remained of the seed, and uh, people only started to notice it when, um, when one started to notice mysterious Bitcoin thefts, because you had nonce reuse in the CDSA signatures, which break down in a very, very bad way if you if your randomness is not really good. Um, so here we can, we can see that this, the seed is overwritten by some clearly irrelevant data. So it is still red, but uh, you could use maybe some kind of hypothetical data flow analysis to find out that your important material is overwritten by something irrelevant. And uh, in the end, uh, another complication uh, part, this is the GNU PG bug, which we actually found here in, in the process of this research, and I will explain that towards the end. Um, this is more involved. Oh, and, and just on a side note, so this kind of entropy loss phenomenon is not limited to cryptographic PRNG, but you can also have it in non-cryptographic PRNG, and you can actually have it in any kind of system that in some way processes entropy. In, in, in the ASLR, um, ASLR part of the Linux kernel, through, I don't know, a bad shift of the variable, they lost some bits of randomness, so they were not randomizing um, the memory to, to the degree they should have, and, and, and so on and so on. Also, basically any application that processes entropy is susceptible to entropy loss and can be, and that can be checked with techniques like that. <clears throat> All right, so the overall analysis procedure is about as follows. So the first is the user has to identify this deterministic part of the PRNG. That is relatively straightforward. You need some basic programming skills. Uh, you need to fix here for the tool that we use the analysis scope. So we need to fix the length of the seed and of the output. And we are typically working with practical values like seeds of, I don't know, 40, 60 byte. This is, well, for many PRNGs, this is even more than, than, than fits in the internal state. And uh, an important part, I will talk about that in a moment, we have to do something about these cryptographic functions in the PRNG because they complicate reasoning. And um, the tool generates the verification condition, checks it for satisfiability, and if it finds um, that the entropy loss condition is satisfiable, it will um, show you a visualization of the of this entropy loss, so essentially, if I have time later, I can, I can show you that, but essentially it's just two traces with different seeds that produce the same output, and you can actually see the cryptographic primitives called with different values, and you can trace the execution, and you can understand where the problem is happening. And it could either be a real alarm, in this case you need to do something, fix, understand it, fix things, or it could be a false alarm because the, um, uh, the idealization that you have chosen in step three is insufficient, and then you have to refine it and, and, and then repeat the procedure. All right. So, uh, crypto functions, what to do with them? This is an example of a typical call to a crypto function that the PRNG performs in OpenSSL. Uh, in, in the rand add, this is the code that actually transfers the seed into the internal state, so the, the, the seed is hashed. And, and not only the seed, the seed is supplied in this buffer um, called buff, and, and, and the buffer is actually concatenated with other things that in this particular call um, do not carry entropy. So there are some counters, and then there is a chunk of the internal state which is empty at, at, at this point, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the thing is we need to show injectivity of a function that is defined in terms of this. And, of course, it is unreasonable to expect that we can show, well, either proof or disproof injectivity of such a function because uh, the SHA-1 hash here is explicitly designed to uh, prevent um, finding collisions with um, uh, acceptable, acceptable overhead. Uh, so instead, what we actually want to do is we want to assume that there is no entropy loss in the cryptographic primitive, and uh, instead only concentrate on finding entropy loss in the kind of non-standard user-defined application code around the cryptographic primitive. So 
in the situation here, we know that, well, the output of SHA-1 is a 20 byte uh, chunk. And we know here that this uh, buff buffer, which is a parameter to the method, contains a 20 byte of entropy. And it is concatenated with some other things. And we know from the way the hash function works is that it will actually perform an um, angelic choice of the entropy. So it will uh, identify in a way that the entropy is indeed contained here and it will distill and extract it and, all right, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, output that in, in some rehashed way. And the key part is that we want to do this extraction manually. So we want to replace uh, this extraction by hash function um, with an explicit user given choice. So we want to identify 20 bytes in this whole concatenation where the entropy is supposed to be. And on one hand, we could just brute force this. So there are, I mean, the, if we assume that the entropy is contained in a contiguous chunk, which is reasonable, uh, we don't have a lot of choice. We can choose between the three first choices and the other two have improper size and, and then there are I think seven of such primitives so essentially it could be brute force but we didn't bother so we asked the user to do it uh, also taking um, contextual clues like variable naming and, and bit patterns that you see in the, in the traces and so on. So this is an easy puzzle for the user to solve. But the thing is what do we do about that so if once we identified that buff uh, is the thing where the entropy will be supplied to the hash function we can do two things. We can either replace this whole expression by the, um, the buffer containing the entropy, so the, the buff thing. And this is clearly entropy preserving. But on the other hand, it is unsound because we replaced one function by a completely different function that just happens in the way that PRNGs are made to be OK. But it is clearly unsound. So the results we obtain with this idealization will not transfer to the original one. But it is indeed useful because uh, the actual bit patterns in the seed, just by propagating them, you, you can see when you look at the trace, you can see how the seed actually flows along your code. It, it, it maintains the same bit patterns. But in the end, we, once we are OK with that, we actually want to replace this kind of idealization by a different one. And this is um, a sound, usual abstract specification of a function that will tell us we remove this and we replace it by a fresh symbol that is injective from its buff parameter to the output. And this is then actual property that every hash function satisfies in this case. And, and, and uh, this kind of idealization will be sound. And the results, if we can prove that there is no entropy loss, then the results will carry over to the original implementation. Um, just a little bit about the implementation. It is based on the CBMC model checker for C in Java and a mini SAT SAT solver. And um, it works like that, that the model checker computes this generator function from the source code. And then our tool builds from this G piece um, the verification condition and then feeds it to mini SAT and mini SAT checks it for satisfiability. This is all in propositional log logic, by the way. And if this formula has a model, then this is an indication of an entropy loss and we can actually visualize it. Um, okay, I will, I, Sean, I don't have the time to show the visualization. Anyway, and the turnaround time is roughly 30 seconds just for the automatic check. And uh, so we, we try to keep it in the time where it's uh, comfortable to use it interactively. Um, right, just a quick summary of uh, findings that we had. So we applied this to a number of PRNGs. In the first three ones, we did not find entropy loss. We found in partially some kind of questionable coding practices, but uh, nothing that <laughs> would actually degrade performance. Uh, we can indeed find this Android bug that I have shown you. Um, the open SSL, we can detect the Debian disaster. We can also find that there is some entropy loss that uh, in open SSL that the designers thought was a good thing uh, for reasons that I don't have the time to discuss now. But uh, also we found, for example, that they did uh, break a little bit the indexing into the circular state buffer. And then there is indeed one byte in this buffer that um, under adverse conditions is not read. So 
it is also quite clear that nobody in the meantime understands how the openness cell pair in G code is supposed to work in detail. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a question of what to do it. But if we apply a local fix, we can actually verify with the tool that it indeed fixes this particular problem. And then um, uh, we, we looked at libgcrypt and gnupg and indeed uh, find a problem here. Okay, very briefly. So you see the state of the PRNG here and uh, the libgcrypt uh, follows the design proposed by Gutmann some time ago. And the idea is that to mix the state, you take a sliding window and you hash it and, 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 and copy it back in, in, into the state and then just kind of move the window along, hash again, copy, move along, copy and so on. And uh, the implementers of the libgcrypt actually thought, oh, we will make it, I don't know, more efficient, more clever, more whatever. And, and we actually leave out this region in, in, from the sliding window. So we do not um, hash, we do not include this part, the hash part in the hash to compute the hash here. And when you look at it like that, you immediately see that um, this part here is actually overwritten by some entropy data that is not derived from, uh, from, from the data in this very place. So this, this chunk actually will be lost. And, and when you can look at that, it's, it's quite easy to discern, but uh, of course they didn't stop at that. They, I don't know, maybe they recognized the problem and they thought, oh, we'll make the first iteration even more special and we'll leave out the window in the first iteration and then uh, everything will be much more confusing. And um, the, so it is, it is really hard to track the flow of entropy in, in, in this particular design and we needed the tool to, to, to get along with it. So to, to get to the conclusion, um, this particular bug was in, in, in GNU-PG for 18 years and it was not found by several external audits. And it shows you that current state of the art of uh, PRNG quality assertion is, is, is unsatisfactory and we actually need tools like this to find things. And these tools are not completely automatic, so the user still needs to intervene in some sense. But the good thing is you do not have to have like a high level clever insight into what is happening. And you also do not have to track, um, to keep track of this minutia of the index pointer manipulation and so on. You can just be a trained monkey and you can find flaws in real PRNGs. Thank you very much. Questions for our speaker? Please come up to the microphone, state your name and affiliation. Hi, Max Baker from Cryptography Research. I'm wondering if you've ever applied this to a circuit implementation. Uh, to which one? A circuit implementation, instead of software to hardware. Um, you could, if you, if you have some, um, well, on one hand, you could, you could uh, take some tool that allows you reasoning about, about hardware. But actually, if you want to give up some completeness, you could also do things. What, what you could do is you could uh, seed the PRNG with some random seed. And you can then do this uh, replacement of the crypto primitives. I don't know how that would work in hardware, but conceptually. And then this is really this replacement is the key part because it increases the power of the analysis. And then you should try to make this replacement in a way that the PRNG will output the seed. So you try kind of to fake an identity function and, and then you know it is indeed injected. And it will not work for all PRNGs, but it will work for many. Thank you. Hi, this is Ankur from Arizona State University. So I have also used CBMC in like uh, analyzing stage fright and other kind of vulnerabilities, but like other static analysis tools, these have high false positive rates. So have you like done some sort of cross project validation or Okay, thanks. Uh, the answer is so CBMC is um, a bounded model checker and as such it is actually precise. So you are not getting false positives with CBMC. I okay. hope this answers your question. Okay, sure. Cool, I think last question. Hey, Manuel Egele, Boston University. Awesome talk. Um, similar spin on, on, on this question. So with the guarantees that, get, that you get from CBMC, can we deduce soundness from your overall results in the sense that the things that you looked at, there is no further uh, entropy loss in there because otherwise you would have found it? Uh, so the whole tool chain, if you use the sound idealization, then the whole tool chain is sound in the given 
bounded scope. So for the given size of the seed and the output, if the tool says everything is fine, everything is indeed fine. And so half a second follow up with the previous answer, we're sounding complete at the same time, given in the bounds. Uh, say it again. With the previous uh, answer in mind, we're sounding complete at the same time, given within the bounds. It is sound, but it is not complete. Because you are idealizing the, um, the crypto function, and if you are a psychopath, you could create a PRNG that uh, would require to be shown correct the tool to have as small completeness gap as possible. So you could do that, but of course the real implementations are not like that and, and the completeness issue is, is not really relevant in practice. Cool, let's thank our speaker. All right. Thank you, everyone, for staying with us. Uh, our last talk of this session is going to be on a very interesting new type of security competition that I'm really excited to learn more about, uh, the Build It, Break It.